It's Zarek from Milkara Product Dynamics, and I'm happy to be here today with Andrea Checky. And Andrea is over here to do a, a series of Gonstead seminars uh, for BCC students. And this is uh, weekend number six, six this time, uh, six out of seven. And uh, yeah, in, in Ireland, we have a, a phrase we say, I like him because he calls a spade a spade, which basically just means this person, they, uh, they, they tell it like it is, i.e. a spade's a spade. You wouldn't call it a shoveling device. Just call it what it is. And Andrea certainly calls a spade a spade. And you're a, you're a Gonstead diplomat yep. and you've been practicing uh, Gonstead for many years. And now you're going more into like the, the, the AK stuff and going deep into like the more uh, neurological side of things. So he's a wealth of knowledge and it's great to have him here for the Gonstead seminar. And we just want to uh, pick his brain a little bit. Thank you for, for your time. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I, um, I've been doing Gonstead my whole professional career. I started school in 1998. I'm sorry. Uh, 1994, <clears throat> graduated in 98, and I've been studying Gonstead ever since my first term in school. Uh, after about um, eight years of doing only Gonstead, I realized there was more that I needed to learn, uh, not to take anything away from Gonstead, it was just that there was more knowledge that I needed to acquire. So I started studying uh, AK, <clears throat> and I'm actually a diplomate in AK. I, I achieved that uh, last November. And after doing uh, also AK for some years, I decided that, I mean, I felt that I needed to learn more and I started studying functional neurology. I'm not a diplomat in that and I probably will never be, but I've been studying that also for about uh, 12, 13 years. Um, but I feel that, you know, Gonstead and uh, AK is, um, and you know, the knowledge that I have in functional neurology, we could be, which could be more, it's enough for me to uh, take care of uh, almost any patient that I see. Cool. And uh, one thing I've really picked up like from being at the seminar with you is the really uh, intense attention to detail, yeah. whether it's going through the analysis properly, scoping properly, the, the, the contact point that you're using, like everything that you do has to be exactly so. And it's very, it's very binary. Uh, you either do it or you don't. Uh, and that's why it was no surprise to me whenever you, you came off just casually that you, um, you were an, an Olympian. Uh, do you want to talk about that? I'm not an Olympian, but I imagine that uh, I tried to be. I wanted to be for boxing, but I wasn't ne anywhere near that level. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the intensity and the, the drive that you needed to, to get to that level of your sport and then how you took that into, into chiropractic? Because I think that probably really set you up with the mentality to get to where you are. Well, it, it is possible, Zarek. Thank you for the question. That's nice. Uh, I mean, um, being an athlete is what brought me uh, to chiropractic and uh, probably chiropractic is, I mean, they go hand in hand. I've been a swimmer my whole life. I've been uh, lucky enough to be a successful swimmer. Uh, I actually um, qualified for the Olympics in 88. Then I had a, um, some kind of um, semi-health situation, meaning I was diagnosed with the uh, heart arrhythmia. And so I was taking my, um, my eligibility for swimming was taken away oh, wow. from Italy. In the meantime, so I did not go to the Olympics in 88. I did qualify because uh, that year there were five, um, um, five selections meets and I participated in four and I won three of the four in the 100 breaststroke and three of the four in the 200 breaststroke. The last one was, um, was also a qualification, but I, I don't want to say it was a formality because it wasn't, but I was... Uh, 90% qualified already. Uh, I had to go to the hospital instead. The hospital basically cl cleared me out, meaning that I could uh, do sport, but the Italian Federation decided that um, for whatever reason, they didn't give me the uh, eligibility back. With, I went to the, in the meantime, I was going to the United States to study uh, physiology because I wanted to keep swimming. And uh, there was no um, swimming in chiropractic. So I went to UCLA, studied uh, human physiology. And uh, I was there to keep my, uh, my swimming going. So I was actually recruited from the swim team. And uh, with the same tests that in Italy did not allow me to participate in the Olympics, in the US they allowed me to compete. So for about three years I was um, world ranked. Uh, I was top 20 in the world in, uh, in the 100 breaststroke. Uh, as an Italian swimmer that could not 
compete for Italy in Italy. I could compete in the United States, but not uh, not for Italy. So anyway, to make a long story short, I got my first degree uh, in physiology. In the meantime, uh, 1991, they cleared me out as far as swimming again in the in Italy. I participated in the World Championship in, uh, in Australia. And then in 92, I qualified for the Olympic Games in Barcelona, here in the city. Uh, so it was my first time in Barcelona back then. And um, I had a, I, I didn't have a great meet. I had some uh, uh, technical problems. I, I, I did a, you know, beginner mistake. I don't know, something was up. But anyway, I participated. I, I qualified, I became 17th in the 100 and the 200. And then I swam a few more years. I got up to the uh, uh, World Championship in Rome, 94. I did an, another couple of European Championship. Anyway, uh, like Zarek was saying, I don't think, I don't think that athletes, high level athletes are normal people. I don't think they are healthy people necessarily, no. uh, and I don't think that uh, if you want to uh, practice at the at the very high level, that you need to be exactly normal. By normal, I mean uh, average, and I mean uh, what what is the norm as a statistical term. You know, the majority of people. I do believe that uh, you know white is white, black is black. I understand that life is uh, you know a million shades of gray in between, but it's either either you do things or you don't. And I'm all for doing it, or at least I'm all for um, being honest, first of all, to yourself, either you did it or you didn't do it, and then to your patients and, uh, and, and you know, and any, everybody around you in your, in your, in your life. So, so I take that as a compliment that I call a spade a spade. Of course, you need to, like we were talking today, you need to love your patients. You don't have to like them necessarily, and you need to be, uh, patient with your patients uh, but still you need to be honest and you need to tell them what's best for them you can be like a, like a loving father if you will meaning you always give them a chance but you can't um, you can't make excuses for them or and most of all for yourself yeah and that's that whole thing about the it's like the coaching aspects of how you approach the patient so you could go at it with a very uh, authoritarian approach as in it's black and white like segafus would be a good example it's like follow the care plan or get out whereas instead of uh was it you that said about the beacon yeah so instead of uh well you can you can uh... well yeah basically what i try to be i try to be uh the image of a beacon the beacon is there if the light is uh is shining very bright many people will choose to follow it and uh, that's what I try to do. I, I don't, it's not like either you follow my plan or get out. It's like, you know, this is the plan. It is very important. I'm going to give you a chance to follow it. If you don't follow it, but you get close to it, you're still going to get results. But you need to know that it's going to take longer. You're going to suffer for a longer time and you're going to pay more money. So when people hear that, typically they feel accepted and they feel safe and they typically, um, buy uh, not not buy meaning in, in the monetary also in the monetary but by they they accept the care plan that i offer to them i uh i i i am as um comprehensive as they allow me to be i i talk about what they eat uh, i talk about what they do for exercising i go as far as um, uh, going into uh, buying a heart rate monitor giving them a heart rate um, 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 area of, of working out, giving them exercises. I, I do as much as they want me to do. But the, the main thing, what makes me a chiropractor is the ability to locate, detect the subluxation and correct it. So they have to allow me to do that. Otherwise, I can't help them. Once they allow me to do that, if they eat properly, they're going to get better faster. If they exercise properly, they're going to get better they're gonna hold better the, the adjustment. They're gonna uh, get to the to be independent, not needing me. Uh, I try to take everybody where they're where they are, and try to take them into functioning as close as possible to 100%. And then I give them the possibility of doing uh, uh, maintenance and prevention. But we need to understand that as you know, as chiropractors, that before they get to maintenance and prevention, in they may need two or three years of care. It's not gonna be every day. It's not gonna be every necessarily every week but it's going to take it takes time to uh, fall out of health and it takes time to get back into optimal health and we don't need to be afraid to tell people the truth 
and um, you've you've done. Can you talk a little bit about being in school and then going for the Gonstead diplomacy and what that was like and the frustrations that come with that and how long it took? Because th this seminar is the first uh, like credits that I can use towards if I decide to do the the Gonstead diplomacy because you need so many hours and then you go and do the exam. Can you talk about that? Sure. And were you always doing this more holistic approach where you're looking at their exercise and you're looking at the diet or was it Gonstead very much from the start and then you add the other stuff in as you go in your knowledge base grows? Yeah. You know, when I graduated, I thought that uh, Gonstead was all that I uh, that I needed to know and was uh, all that anybody ever needed to, you know, an adjustment was all that you needed to be healthy. Well, um, I don't really believe that. In the meantime, I studied the Gonset work and, and was it what he did. And I discovered that, for example, Dr. Gonset was, uh, as he was practicing chiropractic, he also became a naturopath. Mm -hmm. I discovered that he was uh, giving actually vitamins to all his patients. He was very close to standard process uh, products, which are excellent. And, um, and these are things that I, the naturopath I found out later. The fact that he was giving vitamins, I found out uh, very soon in my career because uh, I learned from Dr. Thatcher and I'm very proud to say that I was fortunate enough to spend about five years with him in his clinic. Dr. Thatcher is one of the uh, seven people that received a letter from Dr. Gonsett recognizing that they could represent Dr. Gonsett in his absence. So uh, the Cox brothers, they bought the uh, rights to the seminar so automatically they could uh, teach the seminar, but they actually never received such letter. Um, I don't mean to say that they're not prepared to do that. Of course they are. But what I'm saying is that I was fortunate enough to, to learn Gonset secondhand. So Dr. Thatcher was one of the few that learned directly from Dr. Gonset for the time that, that you know took him to a preparation as such as Dr. Gonset said, you can represent me when I'm not there. Do we know who else got? Uh, I don't know the name. Uh, one was definitely Dr. Troxell from GMI, mm -hmm. and uh, Herb Dr. Herb Wood uh, was one of them, mm -hmm. uh, I believe. Um, uh, uh, the guy that wrote the book, Dr. Herbst, was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Faf was one of them, I believe. Um, anyway, I don't know. I don't want to say names that, that I'm mistaken, but what I'm saying is that I felt that I knew Gonset and I did not need any kind of official recognition. Then I went to Italy and I started practicing by myself, of course, and uh, you talk to people and you get this kind of uh, response, you know, oh, you do Gonset? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do Gonset too. And I say, okay, so you take uh, x-ray. Oh, no, no, I don't take x-ray. Okay, so you scope your patient. Oh, no, no, I don't scope patient. And I'm like, so what do you do? Oh, I adjust on the chair. And, and you see them adjusting and, you know, most people, they crack necks on the chair, you know, sideways, whatever. So... I, I felt that in order to, to, um, to say, well, you know, if you do Gonset, you need to have the x-ray, you need to have the scope, you, know, you need to do things a certain way. You know, the other question would be, oh, you have a knee chest. Oh, no, I don't have a knee chest. I'm like, okay. So I decided I needed the, um, the, 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 the official recognition so I could have the leverage to say, actually, I'm sorry. If you do it this way, you, you, you know of Gonset, you use some of the technique, but you're not applying the method. Either you apply the method or you don't. And so I had, I had the binary thing again. Exactly. I mean, I mean, you can. It's okay. Like I said, you know, I'm not saying you're not good. I mean, you can be a much better doctor than I am, mm -hmm. but you're not applying the constant method. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I had enough credits because when I was in school, I went to school in Minneapolis at Northwestern College of Chiropractic. I have, I have been going to Mount Horror many times, and I had. I developed friends in the Gonset community that are now on the boards. And my one of my other teacher was Dr. Gary Panabaker. He was the president of the uh, Gonset, um, I don't remember which committee, but he was very much involved. He passed away a few years ago. So I had enough credit that I could take this, the, the exam. I had to study though. I mean, there, there are three books and there are several questions and I you have to prepare questions. So it was it was a pleasant process, but I had to, go and study again what kind of uh, format is it um, is there a lot of questions or is it like a I, you have exam? you have to prepare uh i don't remember how many questions that you need to give them multiple choice question which proves that you've read the books out of the books that they give you you know one is a chapter one is blogger's book uh and then and one may be um, the, the pediatric book no 
and then when you go there you you turn this in and if they approve it then there is a, a written exam and it's a i think it's multiple choice but i mean it, it was uh it was more intense than i thought mm -hmm. and when you pass that then you do a practical exam practical exam there is x-ray marking and then there are questions and then you have to demonstrate your your ability your your capacity in adjusting so they give you a listing they give you a, a real person and you have to show that, that you can do the work and there's some case management questions so it was a, it was a good exam and one once you become a diplomat um, then that is your official proof that you know the method and then you can start teaching and when you teach as a diplomat your um, the hours that you teach can count towards a, a, a diplomat now in Europe it's difficult to get diplomat because there are not very many diplomats I think there are three or four throughout Europe and they they don't re really, they're not really involved in teaching too much so i decided that um you know my i feel that one of my mission is to is to um i want to say give back because chiropractic gave me a lot i mean it gave me the uh it's very satisfactory profession i get a lot of joy in uh, in helping people monetarily you can make a very good living without um robbing anybody i mean you can have very uh, reasonable fee, fee can, that most people, if not everybody, can afford, and uh, they can bring their family. You can give family deals and still make make a decent living. Uh, the constant method is uh, quick enough that you can see enough people uh, throughout the day and share your costs. And by costs, I mean the overhead, I mean the secretary, and also the cost of education. I mean, I'm I'm very much into learning. I keep taking seminars. I keep going to the states. Uh, the only way to to keep growing is always uh, comparing, uh, you know, putting you at stake, putting you, uh, I mean, um, uh, on the spot that you have to deliver the proper thing. And and my last uh, uh, my last challenging in improving myself is teaching because you can't, you know, you take the book and you give the uh, you you give the theory, but then students, whether they do it on purpose or not, and students, I mean, students and doctors, whether they do it on purpose or not. They're constantly checking on you. I mean, you say this, but are you actually able to do it? And so it's uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun. I'm hoping that by the time I uh, retire, and I'm hoping never to retire, that I will have you know at least ten doctors that know everything that I know, and they can pass it on. I feel personally that chiropractic is dying, is dying throughout the world, and is dying in Europe especially because, in my opinion, these are my opinion most european graduates don't know what chiropractic is they don't know what a subluxation is and they don't know what an adjustment is it's not their fault you know they paid good money for an education and i don't think they had the um the example of someone that was actually doing the job i mean i'm i'm, I'm not saying that nobody can do the job but nobody's teaching it it's just in general when you talk to a european graduate they talk to you uh, about a subluxation as a biomechanical dysfunction you know i get i get really bad vibes when i hear that i mean it makes me want to throw up uh, it, it, you know that the you know as a profession we complain that uh, physiotherapists and osteopath they're they're taking over and yet the thing that distinguishes us from the rest which is the location and detection of a subluxation and its correction through an adjustment we don't give it we don't know what it is and we don't give it enough importance so one of my professional goal and mission would be to form people that can continue this um, it used to be the reason why i say chiropractic is dying because chiropractors used to be a uh, few numbers of crazy people all they were all saying the same thing very different from traditional medicine uh, now we have many chiropractors and most of them are talking the medical lingo and they are talking that you know subluxation doesn't really it's it's a mechanical dysfunction so within the profession we have people with the same degree talking two different right. very very different uh, language and and it's uh, I, I think it's a shame so what i say is if you want to play football you know uh, soccer football um who makes the rule fifa makes the rule right the the, the international football association now if we're talking about chiropractic who should make the rule the rule 
they shouldn't be made by the schools necessarily. They should, the, the rules were made by the founders, D.D. Palmer, B.J. Palmer, Stevenson, who wrote the books, yeah, we Gonstead. Don't, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We said the same thing today. You know, chiropractors, we are all trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm. The wheel was already invented. We just need to, you know, make a better wheel. It's okay. But, you know, it's just like the constitution of each uh, country. Any law of that country can be a new law, but it has to be inside the constitutional purpose and, and what you can do and you can do. So I'm not saying that we need to stay at 1895 when chiropractic was invented. We can move it forward. We have the, the tools to make better measurements, better diagnosis. But in the end, what distinguish our profession from all the other profession is the correction of the subluxation. Okay. And it's, it, 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 there's nothing as powerful. I'm not saying that's the only thing you need to have a, to have a patient. I'm just saying <clears throat> that's the one thing that distinguish us from anybody else. Okay. So I, uh, I try my best to pass that on. Mm. And, and the way you're saying about the, the professions dying because, uh, now like the, the evidence based people, they're basically coming out and saying things like, yeah, on the surface, there's no difference between a uh, chiropractic and, uh, like a manipulative, uh, therapy. And then I think to myself, I'm like, well, those guys, they probably haven't actually been exposed to to real chiropractic. They've probably never actually had like a diplomat or someone sit with them and be like, all right, guys, this is how it works. This is what can happen. Test my hands. Let me adjust you. Because if you've just been manipulated up and down a table and it's just, you know, H HVLA uh, crack crack, then of, of course there's no, there's not much difference between uh, that and um, manipulative therapy. And I've even had... um patients maybe they say like or clients and they say oh i'm gonna go and uh i'm gonna go and try osteopathy or i'm gonna go to this and that therapist and for me i'm always like okay i'm like look go try it if you prefer it stay there but if you prefer what we're doing here then you know come back and you're welcome back and then we work together i don't see it as a threat because i'm like there's nothing if you're practicing chiropractic it's not a competition. I'm like, okay, go, like, go and try it. And they always, uh, they're always going to come back. Like, it's, I don't see it as competition because the two just aren't similar. They're just completely different. Yeah, competition doesn't really exist. I mean, you, you're going to draw the people that possibly you can help. And competition with a different profession doesn't exist. What I try to teach in the seminar, one of my spiel, so to speak, is, uh, is a butchering competition with the surgeon. I mean, they both use some kind of a knife but they're not in competition you know a butcher a butcher is going to cut steaks and, uh, and a surgeon is going to do incision to remove some kind of pathology or make some kind of uh, changes in in the body that is uh, operating on and and i consider myself uh, i think we should all consider ourselves at the same level as surgeons so the incision has to be absolutely precise the patient may die uh, i think that a subluxation may kill you and the removal of the subluxation is life-saving. Um, I don't think I'm crazy. I mean, I, it, it, if a subluxation does what they say it does, I mean, they reduce uh, the ability of the propagation of the mental impulse, which is something that is uh, more and beyond the neurological um, output, output of your brain. Then if you reduce that ability, your health is gonna be diminished. And when health diminishes, you get closer to dying. It's just a fact, okay? It doesn't mean that you're gonna to die today. I mean, if the surgeon makes a mistake, the patient may die today. If you make a mistake, it's not gonna to die today, but they get closer to you know, death than they were before because their health is gonna be diminished. That's why I'm so, um, I try to be so intense and passionate because I believe that if a patient comes to my office asking for my help, um, I should do the best that I can. And the best that I can is gonna be done with the smile, but with very much intensity. And if I cannot deliver it that day, I'll try harder the next time. Um, so the profession is dying in a sense that um, if you're doing biomechanical dysfunction, it's a biomechanical thing. It's not, it's not a, it has a lot less to do with health than the subluxation does. And um, if we don't, if, if we do that, we don't really have a reason to exist because Physiotherapy does that, and any kind of manual therapy is addressing biomechanical dysfunction. My clinical experience is that if you 
measure the biomechanical dysfunction in a sense that you know restricted joint motion uh, it's a way of assessing if you do muscle testing is another way of assessing and if you use a nervoscope is another level of assessing my experience is that if you make an adjustment you will change the three of them if you make some kind of manipulation you will most likely change and effect improve the, the restricted motion on the joint if you do something better you will change the muscle uh, testing outcome but not, not necessarily the, the nervoscope and so the nervoscope is really an extremely difficult tools to have but but the most valuable if you want to know whether you have corrected the subluxation and you have used your nervoscope um, it, it's going to be something I mean it happened to me more than once I mean it happened to me regularly that uh, when I'm not sure and I recheck with the nervoscope the change was not made so at that point you have a choice you can decide you can choose whether uh, you know the nervoscope doesn't work whether you don't really need to make a change in the nervoscope or whether you need to be better and um, you know I, I try I usually try to be better we had um, we had a teacher in school back you know when I was in school and um, this person was uh, the son of a very, very good chiropractor. This, his father created a very uh, successful practice. And then the father was so successful that he didn't want to work anymore, waited for the, for the son to come out and uh, gave him his, uh, his office. Well, the son wasn't ready for, for, for the office and within a few years, uh, the, 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 the chiropractic was not, office was not successful anymore. So at that point, he had a choice. He could choose whether to think that he wasn't good enough or that chiropractic didn't work. He decided that chiropractic didn't work and, and founded the skeptic, uh, chiropractic skeptic group in the United States. He became the president and he was one of our teacher. So I don't think I need to say how many lessons I attended of the, of the professor. I respected him, but he didn't have anything to offer to me. So I went to the exam, passed the exam and moved on. Um, the thing is this, um, chiropractic is it's simple in his idea, you know, the philosophy is simple, but it's a very technical ability. And just like any technical skill, you're going to need years to master any kind of sport you need to do for at least eight to 10 years before you become very good at it. Mm. And it's the same with chiropractic with the adjustment. You know, How long were you swimming before, before you qualified for the Olympics? Did you pick it up and six months later you qualified? No, no. Or I did started, it take a little while? It takes a long time. I mean, I started was eight, nine years old, and I qualified in 88. I was 20. So there you go, about 12 years. Yeah, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a and, while. And I've, I've seen that as well, like in the clinic, because um, people, that, and I actually think sport helps chiropractic students this, because if you've encountered this in life, like I didn't just pick up a pair of boxing gloves when I was 12 and and win championships it took a couple of years of trial and error to get to that and maybe that prepared me a little bit for school because you're going to start adjusting and it's either not going to work at all or you might make something pop but you're going to make it pop really badly and you get discouraged and then a lot of people are like okay well I'm just going to go and try something else and now I see people they'll do like test after test after test after test and they're using a broad scope of all these different techniques and their analysis might be really good and then it's like okay i fire an activator into the pi of a 90 kilogram guy because i don't know how to side posture they get discouraged early on because it doesn't come easy and they're like oh well instead of doubling down and working harder at it i'll just go and uh, i'll just go and do something else yeah i had a i had a friend um yeah some somebody who helped me who had gone through Northwestern before me and he was helping me with some uh, with therapy he was a chiropractor of course but he was very much into uh, muscle work and he studied ART active release technique and he was doing that very successful I mean very very effective but not not an adjustment and one time he saw me practicing on my own what I did was uh, I had a dry spine and to recreate the subluxation I uh, I put elastic bands uh, between spinuses and between transverses and stuff to recreate all the various listing and put a towel over it and try to with my hands you know mimic the motion to to be precise and he told me I was crazy I mean maybe I was but I mean how else are you gonna practice you know it's uh, 
it, it takes time. So it, it, it takes times and frustration may help you. Just don't get discouraged. Um, uh, as long as you, you need to be gentle, Gonset is actually a very gentle way of adjusting. If you see the videos of Dr. Gonset, he was always, I mean, you, 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 you use the tip of your finger. Mm. Most patient that, um, patient that were adjusted by him, and I was able to talk to a few of them, they said that you could barely feel his hands, and then boom, you know, it, it, the adjustment came. Um, so I, I was in close contact with two people that learned directly from him, and um, I, I never met Dr. Gonset. He passed away before I, I, I got to chiropractic. But, um, you know, I'm, gonna just gonna, I'm just trying to pass on. And what I do in my office is not only Gonset. I mean, Gonset was, uh, he, first of all, he was a chiropractor. So when I teach Gonset, first I try to teach the, the chiropractic philosophy mm -hmm. and the chiropractic method. I mean, he didn't invent uh, radiography. He didn't invent uh, the nervoscope. He put together a method that was very successful. You know, B.J. Palmer was already, was already using the Neuroscope and already using Radiograph, and he was saying the need for these things. Uh, Gonset put it into a method that is, if you apply, you know, verbatim and consistently, you're going to get results. Uh, but you can add to that. I mean, it was, it was always very, very, what I'm told, by, what I was told by Dr. Thatcher and by anybody who knew him, that he never discarded any kind of theory or any kind of uh, uh, new thing. He was all all for finding a better way. Mm. Um, I was told this time and again, they used to say, oh, Dr. Gon said, you know, you can do this this way. His answer was usually, oh yeah, I tried that 1967 and it doesn't work. Because when something new came up, he would take a radiograph of a patient and do six, seven, eight adjustments, whatever, in the new way, take it out of x-ray and look for, for changes. Mm. And if there wasn't a change within six visits, he'd be upset. I know this, you know, firsthand. He expected changes. If you see somebody and every time you see him, you do the same thing, there's something missing. Either you're not adjusting properly or you didn't find the major subluxation, which is another concept that was lost. Uh, we don't need to address everything in the spine. It's either one or two adjustment. If you make a change every time you see a patient, if you make one change, within a few visits, you will have changed their health, okay? And within a few weeks, their life will be affected for the better. I read in uh, Matthew Arman's book that they used to have technique symposiums. So yeah. there would be a big hall and it would have been more like, you know, Gonstead would have been there and Clay Thompson would have been there. And it wasn't so much like the technique, like pissing contest, oh, my seminar is better than your seminar. It was more like chiropractors getting together and seeing like what method they could share. So, oh, I'm doing it this way. What do you think of that? Okay, well, I'm doing it this way. But on that uh, topic, do you think, because you seem to have gone very deep into the Gonstead and mastered that and then gone and done more like the, the AK stuff and gone into that. Do you have any advice for students regarding that? As in, a lot of students are doing a lot of different things. They're like, oh, I do a little bit of Gonstead, a little bit of Thompson, a little bit of AK. And they, AKs, I don't know anything about AK, but AK seems like it would be difficult to learn. You're not just going to pick it up and uh, do it. It's going to take a while. Do you have any um, advice for students that are maybe a little bit confused about their technique and they, they're trying to pick which one to go to? What would your strategy yeah. be? Dr. Gary Pannenbaker always used to say, don't be a jack of all trade and a master of none. So I tried to be a master of what I was doing. And when I felt that I was uh, mastering it enough, not to the top level, but enough, and maybe I felt that I could benefit from more knowledge, then I started studying something else. But, um, you know, there are many techniques in chiropractic and all of them, I'm sure they work. I don't know them all, but I'm sure they all work. And why do they say that I'm sure they all work? Because if the technique is alive, someone is doing it. And if they're doing it, they're making a living. So I'm sure they're working. Um, what makes us together you know as a profession is the subluxation and the adjustment what created chiropractic is the subluxation and the adjustment so to any student my advice would, would would be before you learn other things make sure that you know what is a subluxation make sure you know how to detect the subluxation and make sure you know how to adjust it at least at a functional level that you can practice once you have that then you can go into something else. 
but um, to have many ways of um, diagnosing the problem is not necessarily going to help you because any of this method should be enough to treat any patient that you see. So pick one and stick with that until you become an expert and then you can do something else. So the reason why I dove into uh, Gonset was because of what I saw from Dr. Thatcher, because I was looking for answers and nobody had them in school and he had them. And because I saw the efficacy, I saw what he saw in his office. I mean, from the heart attack to the baby with ear infection. Uh, you know, we, we seem to forget that the first 50 or 60 years of our profession, well, what chiropractors used to see were infectious diseases, okay? Hospitals back then were a different story. Antibiotics were not really developed the way they are right now. Most people going to a hospital for, for an infectious disease, disease, they were dying. So people would try to stay out of the hospital and chiropractic was a, was a very effective and good. The Spanish uh, flu is a good example. <clears throat> exactly. So we, you know, chiropractic was born uh, because, uh, because the first patient was death from one ear, was death from one ear. And then we became licensed because of the results through the Spanish flu epidemics, okay? And what happened was at that time, uh, chiropractic was not licensed in um, almost in any state. And because um, the mortality amongst people, this is documented, this is uh, historical data. Uh, the mortality in general of the Spanish flu was about 20% for people going into the hospital seeking medical attention. And the mortality amongst people seeking chiropractic attention was uh, less than 1%, was about 0.5%, so 1 40th of the other people. So entire families were saved by chiropractic. But we're not evidence-based. We're not evidence-based, I mean, whatever. You know, I, I am, <laughs> in, in the beginning, I was getting upset. In the beginning, like everybody, I was looking for the evidence-based. If anybody wants to go into reading the research that is already out there on chiropractic, I, we don't need any, any new research, okay? Uh, we are not recognized at that level because there is a power that doesn't want us to be recognized at that level, which is okay. I don't consider the, the medical uh, establishment as my uh, enemy. I mean, I, I cooperate with many medical doctors. Uh, there is a place, a time and a place for medicines. Um, I, I think it's, it's wonderful and it's very good that we have them. Anybody may need them. Um, and it's okay. I mean, we should, we should cooperate. We give two very different uh, things to the patient. Uh, if there is a pathology, um, a real pathology, you can get adjusted, but oftentimes medicine may have the uh, emer emergency answer for that, which is perfect. If you want to reestablish total 100% fun function, I feel and I believe that chiropractic has more to offer. That is, This is my opinion, my clinical experience. Um, so profession was born because uh, somebody was deaf for one year, uh, it became licensed because of the results with the Spanish flu. As I was saying, you know, the United States, many states were, they didn't have very many people. And if the governor family or somebody in his family was saved by a chiropractor, then the gover governor most likely would, would license that profession. And that's the way it started. The Mayo Clinic as well, the, the director of the Mayo he Clinic. He went was. to B.J. Palmer. There, there, is a, there is a history, I mean, there is the documentation of the, uh, you know, Dr. Mayo writing to B.J. Palmer because his wife had a problem and um, B.J. took care of his wife and the wife got better. N no competition, no confrontation, it's just cooperation. We offer different things to the patients. So, you know, deaf one year, infectious diseases, and now we're talking about biomechanical dysfunction for some kind of pain. It's okay, I mean, it, chiropractic is effective for low back pain, but it's, it's a side effect. You know, when you improve people's health, Typically, their pain get better, but uh, it's like you know you you can see you can see this many things, and you can see you can choose to see this small slice of what you could actually potentially help. It's a choice, not a problem. Um, not here to judge, but the the effect of correcting a subluxation is just much more than that. And so for. Um for students over here in Europe, because Gonstead, I don't want to make excuses, but Gonstead is harder to get access to over here in Europe because we don't have the same access to Mount Horror. We don't have the same access to diplomats. Um, what would you say to students, especially in Europe, books to read, seminars to go to, 
practice sessions like what what's the what's the steps for us to reach diplomacy so that there's more of us uh, that's a great question i don't really have an answer for that <laughs> i offer my uh seven weekends seminar um you know i only accept 10 people at a time because i the way i learned was one-on-one -on -one, and i feel that if i have 10 doctors or 10 students i can give them that one-on-one -on -one attention you know m most of our colleagues are uh worried that somebody is going to steal the profession because they see a video on youtube I'm like good luck i mean I, I take people's hand and i move them so they can do it properly and still often they don't get it so well, you can copy if we're, if we're just wrapping a towel around your neck and doing an sure. actual distraction that's pretty easy to copy yeah, you, you can do that you can do the flying seven i mean there is you know there is a there's a, a writing attributed to uh from BJ, not attributed, from BJ Palmer, he said that in 1923, he said in 1923, the profession had reached rock bottom, that only 20% of practicing chiroprac chiropractors were actually doing chiropractic, and only 10% could intelligently uh, discuss chiropractic. Uh, there's a video that we watched of Dr. Gonsett saying basically the same thing. He said, you're not going to like what I tell you, you're going to call me most anything, because 80% of our profession, I can take half an hour get someone from the street and teach them the same thing uh, it's difficult you know that it, what we do it's very simple as far as the general it's idea easy, yeah. but it's very difficult it takes years of practice uh, so it's easy to go and do something addressing the biomechanical dysfunction and going to the energy level i'm not i'm not talking down about those things okay no not at all what i'm saying is that every chiropractor should first know how to adjust locate a subluxation and then you can add to that mm -hmm. ak for me is a diagnostic tool i don't really use many of the uh, ak techniques that are there i had to study them for the dvac and i learned them i don't really use any of the reflexes but as far as diagnosing the problem and helping me realize if i have corrected the subluxation helping me decide what to adjust muscle testing to me is um, is extremely effective it gives me a window like no functional neurology always talks about the window into you know um, measuring and detecting a problem uh, functional neurology gives me an opportunity to measure more things uh, the reason why i want to study that is because i saw this wonderful thing that functional neurology could do and i believe that an adjustment is doing exactly that but we don't measure it and why we don't measure it often because we are trying to see an extra patient often because we don't know what to measure if but i don't measure it then i might only see 45 patients in the afternoon and not 48 but 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 it's uh we owe that to the profession we owe that to ourselves and to our patients because when you measure the change um, then you've done something great and if you can uh, relate that to other people if you can have um, uh, if you can tell them what you can achieve, it's, uh, it's just a good thing. So if you take an extra minute, you may see one less patient, but you may draw to your clinic, you know, 10, 20, 100 more patients because you can, you can show what you're doing. And I'm not talking about putting up a show. I'm just, you can demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the, the um, double blind study, you know, uh, act, what, do you, what do they call it? The uh, evidence-based, whatever, that's fine. But one of the things that we keep saying that is not good about medicine is that they have protocols, is that they go by protocols, they don't, they don't see the patient in front of them, they go by the majority, and then we want to do the same thing with evidence-based. I mean, evidence-based may say something, but the patient on my chair may show something different. I'm gonna go with the clini clinical evidence. Clinical evidence, they can say that it's uh, anecdotal, but when you have thousands of anecdotal saying the same thing it's it's not anecdotal anymore uh, you can have you can have the same problem coming from a different subluxation and so it doesn't mean that necessarily this means that you have to do that but if you have an analogy it guides you in that direction that you have to find it on the patient you must have an x-ray i cannot tell you what kind of information you can get from the x-ray if you know how to read it reading an x-ray requires many years of experience uh today uh, could i adjust someone with an x-ray sure i could i mean if i were on a deserted deserted island you know no scope no x-ray i think i could 
I think I could do enough to help that patient. But if I have the, the, the ability of having an x-ray, I don't want to give that up. I mean, it's just uh, incredible. Today with Mathieu, we were looking at an x-ray, and I, I didn't know who it was. And he's asking me about cervical, and I said, no, leave the cervical alone. You know, the x-ray is showing that you should leave it alone. It should be lower here. So we start looking at the, um, at the upper thoracic, and T3 looked to me like it was probably subluxated. Of course, you have to check it on the patient. And I asked Mathieu, I said, does this patient has any, uh, is it a male or female? Female. Does she have any kind of uh, breast issues? Because T3 typically goes to the breast and typically exactly to the nipple. And he said, yes, she has breast cancer. So maybe it's a coincidence, but you know, these kind of coincidences, they happen all the time. And the more prepared you are, the more you're gonna know. Uh, Phyllis Markham was the lady that was studying the x-ray for Dr. Gonstead. And one of my friends, Dr. Lyon, uh, in the, he's from Wisconsin in the States, he studied many hours with her. And he was impressed the first time, or one of the first time, because he put up an x, somebody put up an x-ray. Phyllis was looking at the x-ray and she says, that this, guy, this guy has stomach problem, right? And the doctor said yes, and he, he went to the x-ray looking for what he was written. You know, it, there must be a note somewhere. Well, she could understand that he had stomach problem because of the, what, he, what she could see on the x-ray, the, the, the pattern of subluxation that was there. So x-rays, if you know how to read them, you get an incredible amount of information. And full spine x-rays, full spine standing x-rays, no other x-ray. You know, a cardiologist is not going to check just one heart chamber. The heart is four chambers, you check them all. The spine is 24 bones plus the pelvis and the occiput. If you're, if you're caring for the spine, you take a full spine x-ray. There is no other way. But the evidence tells us that we're overrating the patient and that the x-ray doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't add enough to the treatment. Well, I disagree with that. My clinical experience and my, my professional uh, knowledge uh, says different. So. And, and what would you say to those people? Why should we be x-rayed? Well, because Why is the risk of radiating them completely outweighed by well, the benefits? First of all, with, with today's technique, I mean, the radiation, of it's, it's, it's a non-issue. Okay, you know, we have, now we have the 5G, which is terrible. We have, you know, high power. We have, uh, I mean, we get irradiated. And you take one uh, overseas flight to the States, you get more radiation that, than, uh, than the next way. But bottom line is, uh, it, it's the damage if there is any damage, the damage that you get from an x-ray is by far incredibly less than the benefit that you get from the information that you get for the patient. Um, you know, I, I, it's a non-issue. It's, it's, you, will become, you will become dead before you become sterile from radiation. Okay, so it's just, it's a non-issue. But you need to know what to look on the x-ray because if you're only looking to see if they have a, some contraindication and what, we, what do I keep saying? What is the only contraindication to an adjustment? That the person isn't subluxated. Exactly. So it, it's, not, it's not a show, but you know, if the patient has something very, very serious, health-wise, cancer, uh, any kind of degenerative uh, condition, if they have uh, any kind of disease, uh, if they're subluxated and you correct the subluxation, their health will be better. So you're gonna be beneficial to their health. You, need, you don't need to say that you cure those bad things because you don't, but we can locate and correct the subluxation. And if we do that, we are doing our job. This is what distinguishes us from any other profession. So we all need to be a, experts in correcting the subluxation through a manual adjustment. Yeah, and, and the same way that these guys say oh, the chiropractic adjustment is the same as a manipulation. They're the same people that will be like, oh, well, you can't tell that much from an x-ray. Yeah, if you're looking at the x-ray for a pathology, uh, like a fracture, a cancer, something like that, and you're only looking at it with that lens, then no, it's not It's not going to tell you at all where to adjust. But if you know, uh, and this is what um, Jaime Pineos is saying as well, like you need to know how to read an x-ray chiropractically yes it's very nice and very useful to be able to spot a pathology and you need to be able to do that to be able to do it safely but then you need to be able to analyze it from a chiropractic standpoint now i'm not there yet but i have had a couple of x-rays where you know i'm marking it and then you show it to the patient and you're like oh like there 
of course it makes sense but i don't think people are getting this they're not getting it in the schools it's not being shown to them but they're being shown x-rays from a medical lens it's the same as uh, the scope so people i got a scope um, six months ago and it humbles me every day because it's like you see if you made a change or you don't or sometimes you you, you even made it worse frankly and uh it humbles me every day i think it's a great tool it tells me if i'm getting closer to what it is that i want to do and then you'll have people that say oh well the scope uh, doesn't tell you much and it's just subjective and you're, you're you're just there scoping yeah if you picked one up in a tech lab and you used it for five minutes no it's not gonna really tell you anything but if you're using it and you're taking your time and you know uh what to look for and you're doing it pre and post okay it's gonna take years really but that scope can tell you a lot of stuff so don't just uh, disregard it on the on the first try yes the scope mostly tells you when to adjust and when not to adjust because the hardest thing is very very hard to locate the subluxation but it's even harder to know when not to adjust the x-ray tells you how to adjust and you need that and what to adjust you find on the patient it's a combination of all this information uh, the uh, history of the patient if it's um, a sympathetic problem parasympathetic problem you know the swelling um, all that you the, the pain all that you find on the patient so scope tells you mostly when to adjust x-ray how to adjust and what to adjust you find on the patient of course scoping and x-ray they suggest also where to adjust but you find it on the patient um, you know the, the medical profession they do what they need to do to help the patient so if someone is in a in a trauma they will take 10 15 x-rays if they have to and they should it's the way it should be so if we are doctors primary healthcare physicians we should do the same thing if a doctor feels that they need an x-ray there shouldn't be anybody saying that they, they don't i have i've had and i have medical doctors coming to me and uh, none of them ever question the need for 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 an x-ray it makes sense they understand it they see what you're doing you see what you're doing you 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 must have an x-ray to do the best job that we can do you must have an x-ray and one last question just to, uh, to to jump on what you just said generally speaking how do medical doctors receive uh what what you're doing do they ask questions or are they just kind of like you know what you're what you're doing do whatever um, are they skeptical at first? Like, what's the general uh, consensus? Well, they, I mean, it depends. I mean, every from everybody's personality. In general, they they may be skeptical somewhat, but they they're if they're open enough to come, um, then they they come regularly. I mean, I have, I have medical doctors coming to me for for years, and they they come regularly. It took it took a little longer for them to understand that they need to have some kind of you know maintenance and prevention uh, so they fell in pain a few times and then they come back and then uh, finally usually they say okay I'm gonna come regularly because I understand that's what I need um, and they don't have you know pre think about prevention when should we do prevent what does prevention mean prevention means that you're healthy supposedly 100% healthy and you want to prevent going away from health people do prevention but they are already sick so when you're sick at whichever level, you're not doing prevention. You're already doing care. If, if a patient came to you for prevention and you don't find anything, that is prevention. When you find something, it's already not prevention anymore. Prevention is what we can do on a daily basis to prevent getting sick. So it's what we eat, how much water we drink, the breathing properly, the exercise, the sleeping. You know, I have on my website, I have nine behavior of prevention. When you get to the intervention, it's already not prevention anymore. Um, but typically, medical doctors, I don't have any problem with skeptics. Skeptics do very good in my office. Mm. I have problems with uh, people that are prevented, okay? They already, they have prejudice and they have decided that what you do is not valid. Those people, don't waste your time no you no just don't waste your time i mean you know love them and uh tell them the truth and just uh you know let them let them go their way it's okay um i had a i had a soccer player coming to me um 